Hey guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to press that like and subscribe button below. Guys, that is what keeps the content and videos coming. So on this video, I want to cover client safety with you, okay? So we're gonna practice questions on client safety. Let's jump right into it. So the first question. An ambulatory client is admitted to the extended care facility with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Using, excuse me, in using a fall assessment tool, the nurse knows that the greatest indicator of a fall risk is one, confusion, two, impaired judgment, three, sensory deficits, four, history of falls. And the correct answer is four. And I made a mistake when I was reading the question, I should have said in the greatest indicator of risk and I said fall risk. So I kind of gave you a hint. So guys, the greatest indicator of risk is patient that has a history of falls. Why? Any patient that has a history of falls means they're three times more likely to have another fall. So that places them at grave danger and risk for having a fall, okay? Next question. The workmen cause an electrical fire when installing a new piece of equipment in the intensive care unit. A client is on a ventilator in the next room. The first action the nurse should take is to one, pull the fire alarm, two, attempt to extinguish the fire, three, call the physician to, to obtain orders to take the client off the vent, or four, use an ambu bag and remove the client from the area. And the correct answer is four. Guys, remember when there's a fire, you wanna do R-A-C-E. R stands for rescue. The first thing you wanna do is rescue the patient. This patient happens to be on the vent, so guess what? They're gonna to have to be off of that vent. How are they gonna get oxygen? By that ambu bag that you're squeezing. You're gonna be pushing air into their lungs with the ambu bag, so the first thing you do is R. This in race, R stands for rescue. You're gonna rescue your patient. A stands for alarm. After you rescue your patient, you're gonna pull the alarm. C stands for containment. You need to contain that fire so it doesn't grow bigger. How do you contain the fire? Close the doors, close the windows so the fire chokes because it's not getting oxygen. Remember, oxygen is what makes fires grow. And E is last. The last thing you're gonna do is extinguish the fire, okay? Next question. A visiting nurse completes an assessment of the ambulatory client in the home and determines the nursing diagnosis of risk for injury related to decreased vision. Based on this assessment, the client will benefit the most from one, installing fluorescent lighting throughout the house, two, becoming oriented to the position of furniture and stairways, three, maintaining complete bed rest in the hospital bed with side rails, or four, applying physical restraints. And the correct answer is two, becoming oriented to the position of the furniture and stairways. Here's the thing guys, um, patient with decreased vision, you're gonna have them fix their furniture, you help them fix their furniture, and that furniture does not move. Okay, because if they know where that furniture is, they know where their stairways are, they're less likely to have a fall to trip over things. What else do you wanna do, aside from making sure that that uh, furniture is safe and it stays in the place it's supposed to be? You wanna have good lighting. You wanna make sure there are no throw rugs on the floor. You wanna make sure there are no cords lying around on the floor. You wanna make sure there are handrails throughout the house. You wanna make sure that there are no non-skid, um, there's a non-skid, um, mat in the tub if uh, the patient um, has a history of falls, right? But with decreased vision, if the patient can't see, you wanna make sure that there's nothing that they can trip over, okay? Next question. Which of the following statements by the parent of a child indicates that further teaching by the nurse is required? One, now that my child's two years old, I can let her sit in the front uh, seat of the car with me. Two, I'll make sure that my child wears a helmet when he rides his bicycle. Three, I have spoken to my child about safe sex practices. Four, my child's taking swimming classes at the community center. And the correct answer, guys, is one. That needs further teaching, okay? According to the CDC, if that child's younger than 13, they need to be in the back seat, 
okay? So a child that's two years old, they still need to be sitting in the back seat, not up front with mom. Next question. The nurse assesses that the client may need a restraint and recognizes that one, an order for restraint may be implemented indefinitely until it's no longer required by the client. Two, restraints may be ordered at, on an as needed basis. Three, no order or consent is necessary for restraint in long-term facilities. Or four, restraints are to be periodically removed to have the client reevaluated. And the correct answer guys is four. So restraints in um, each of the states take this very seriously. Number one, you need a doctor's order for restraint. The order for restraint is not indefinite. It's only good for 24 hours. Then in order to get another, um, um, excuse me, to keep that patient in restraints for more than 24 hours, you need a doctor's order. Guess what? That doctor has to have a face to face. They have to have seen that patient, eyeballed that patient, seen the patient, uh, noted that the patient still need restraints to give another order. It's not indefinite. Guys, when the patient's in restraints, you absolutely must, as the nurse, you have to be checking their circulation distal to the restraint because you got to make sure that the, the restraints aren't too tight, that they're cutting off the patient's circulation, right? You have to make sure that you're offering that patient nutrition. And not only are you offering nutrition, you have to document that you offered them nutrition and how often. You have to offer fluids to the patient. You have to document how often you offered the fluids, right? You have to offer the patient the use of the restroom and you have to document how often you offered it to the patient. And you also have to let your patient know the reason why they're in restraints. You have to let them know what kind of behavior they have to exhibit in order to get out of the restraints. So you can't just put a patient on restraints indefinitely. No, they have to know why they're in restraints, what they have to do to get out of restraints. And once that patient demonstrates that behavior, you have to take them off of the restraints. The patient cannot be in restraints indefinitely. Indefinitely, no, that's not it wrong. Indefinitely, excuse me. Next question. Mother of a child enters the kitchen and finds the child on the floor. There's a bottle of, of cleanser next to the child and particles of the substance around the child's mouth. The parent's first action should be one, call the poison control unit, two, provide Epicac syrup, three, check the child's airway breathing, four, remove the particles of cleanser from the child's mouth. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. Okay, guys, so the correct answer, the first thing you're going to do is check that child's airway. You want to make sure that that child's airway has not been obstructed. That's ABC, simple as that. Airway breathing circulation. You make sure that airway has not been obstructed. Right after that, the next thing you're going to do is clear those, um, whatever that the patient, the baby had in their mouth, you're going to remove it, remove those particles. Then you're going to call the poison control center. So the first thing you're going to do is check their airway, make sure that the patient has a patent airway that they're breathing. Two, you're going to remove as much of it, the, the um, fluid or whatever's in that patient's mouth, you're going to remove it. Then three, you're going to call the poison control center. Here's the reason you don't call the poison control center before removing the substance from the patient's mouth. And this is a content concept that you guys are gonna to have to know throughout all of uh, your nursing career. You never leave an offending agent inside of a patient while you're calling for help. It makes no sense. So while you're on the phone with the poison control center, whatever it is that's harming your baby still in the baby's mouth, does that make any sense? No. You're gonna remove as much as you can from the mouth first, right? So that while you're on the phone with the poison control center, it's not still offending their mouth, it's still not causing, um, or still not as harsh of an outcome as it would have been. Next question. Which of the following clients who's experiencing the heat of mid-August is at greatest risk for heat stroke or heat exhaustion? One, a 65-year-old diagnosed with COPD. Two, a 35-year-old novice marathon runner. Three, a 15-year-old playing an outdoor tennis tournament. Or four, a nine-month-old whose bedroom is cooled with a mechanical fan. And the correct answer is one, the 65-year-old diagnosed with COPD. So guys, when it comes to heat exhaustion, heat stroke, let me tell you who's at risk. Anyone who's very old, the elderly, the geriatric community, anyone who's very, very young, 
such as infants, anyone that has a chronic health condition, such as COPD, such as asthma, such as diabetes. So number one, this patient has two of those factors. They're elderly and they have a chronic condition, which is a COPD, okay? So that's why that's the correct answer. Next question. The nurse should recognize which of the following clients is being at greatest risk for an unintentional death. One, a 58-year-old who skis rest regularly. Two, a 44-year-old alcoholic who lives alone. Three, 72-year-old identified as high risk for falls. Or four, 34-year-old diagnosed with chronic depression. And the correct answer is three, the 72-year-old with a high risk for falls. They are at highest risk for unintentional death because what happens is those patients who have a history of falls, remember I told you if they have a history of falls, they're more likely to have another fall, right? So what happens is that patient will have a fall and no one else is there and they're too far away from the phone to call for help. So they end up starving to death or they end up... Um, on the floor, they broke a leg, they end up um, getting a clot, the clot goes to their heart or their lungs, they have an embolism. But the point is, the patient that has a history of falls, they're more likely to have another fall. And so what happens, they're home alone, they have a fall and they cannot call for help and they end up dying unintentionally. Next question. The nurse recognizes that the leading cause of death for the otherwise Healthy one-year-old is one, physical abuse, two, accidental injury, three, contagious disease, contagious diseases, excuse me, or four, stranger abduction. And the correct answer is accidental injury. So let me explain to you guys why. When these um, children, they're one years old, they're learning how to do walk right? And at that age, at one years old, their head is much bigger than their body. So they're learning to walk, they're learning to run, but they don't know how to stop quickly. Or if they do try to stop quickly, what happens is they're running, but remember their head's bigger than the body. So they're running and they try to stop quickly and they topple over. So what happens with the accidental death, they'll accidentally be running and they see the pool and they try to stop and they fall right into the pool because the head's bigger than the body, right? Or because they're walking, they can get into things. So they get into the cabinet where all of the uh, chemicals are and they ingest the chemicals and mom has no idea. Or they're walking and they're able to go out through the front door or the back door because the door was left open and they were fell into a pool or something like that. So with, with the one year, one year olds, um, the biggest problem with that is because they're learning to walk and so they can get around. And that's why um, they're, they're in the leading cause of death in that age group, okay? Next question. Which of the following clients is at greatest risk for injury related to medical diagnoses and conditions? One, a history of asthma and alcohol abuse. Two, a history of heart failure and urinary urgency. Three, a history of hypertension and wearing corrective lenses. Or four, a history of chronic bronchitis and impaired hearing. And the correct answer, guys, is two, a history of heart failure and urinary urgency. And let me explain that to you. So. Patients who are on heart, who have heart failure, excuse me, what happens is there's just too much fluid in the heart. So they get medications to get rid of the fluid. How are they getting rid of the fluid? By urinating, okay? So this patient's going to the restroom a lot and they have urinary urgency. Remember urgency, that's when they feel like they have to go right now, they can't hold it, they can't hold it. So here you are with an, a patient who's running back and forth to the bathroom, they're at risk for what? Falls, that's why they're at risk for injury, okay? So that's the answer to that question. And it makes sense if you think about that patient who has heart disease and they need to get rid of all that fluid and they have urinary urgency. And the question, they kind of gave you a hint. They told you urinary urgency. So that patient's constantly running to the bathroom. So they're the ones who are going to be at greatest risk for injury. Next question. The nurse is discussing safety issues with the mother of three children. Which of the following statements has the greatest possibility for decreasing the potential for injury among the children? One, where do you see a need for safety improvement in your home? 
Two, keep all toxic liquids capped and stored out of the reach of children. Three, installing safety gates at the top and bottom of each set of stairs will help minimize falls. Or four, take great care to keep children away from kitchen appliances and tools that can hurt them. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. Guys, the correct answer is one, asking mom, where does she see the greatest need for improvement? Guys, this is a concept that goes across nursing and you're gonna need it for the rest of your nursing career. Before you can teach a patient, you have to assess what they need to learn. And the only way you know what they need to learn is asking them, what do you know about X, Y, Z? When you ask them that open-ended question, the patient starts talking. And while they're talking, you're listening and you're figuring out, wow, this patient knows a lot. I was gonna start my teaching up here, but it looks like I, um, um, I need to um, start a little bit higher. Or while you're listening, you're like, wow, this patient really doesn't know much. I was gonna start my teaching down here, but it looks like I need to start it a little bit lower. So the first thing you always wanna do is assess. See what that patient knows. Let them talk because when they're talking, that's giving you information on what you need to be teaching that patient. So that's why it's the correct answer. I want you to notice in all the other choices, you are teaching. How do you know what to teach if you don't ask the patient what they know? Okay, next question. When preparing a safety workshop for early teens, 13 to 15 years old, the nurse recognizes that which of the following active strategy topics has the greatest potential for decreasing injuries in this population by affecting lifestyle changes. One, avoiding the nicotine habit. Two, keeping immunizations up to date. Three, eating a well-balanced, a low-fat diet. Or four, wearing a seatbelt when riding in an automobile. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is four. Guys, the leading cause of deaths in teenagers are MVAs, motor vehicle accidents. Now, you gotta just have to think about is these 13, 14, 15 year olds, um, they may not be drivers yet. The 15 year olds might be new drivers. They might have permits, right? They might not be drivers yet, but guess what? Their friends are. Their friends who are 16, 17, 18, right? So what happens is they go joyriding or you know they get in the car and they don't wear seatbelts. The number one cause of death in the teenager, in that age range for teenagers, are automobile accidents. So you're gonna teach them to make sure that they wear a seatbelt every single time that they ride in a car. Next question. The nurse is discussing measures to minimize the risk of injury from an automobile accident with an 83-year-old adult client who lives alone and claims to drive only to church, the doctor's office, and for groceries. Which of the following suggestions has the greatest potential for affecting this client's safety? One, take public transportation whenever available. Two, plan errands around church or doctor's appointments. Three, plan driving for short trips and only during the daylight hours. Four, arrange for family or friends to drive you whenever it's possible. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is three, plan driving for short trips and only during daylight hours. Guys, this preserves that patient's independence while securing safety because especially with the geriatric the elderly population one of their biggest fears is their independence being taken away okay a lot of these um elderly patients they were lawyers and doctors and astronauts astronauts and they had all of these high functioning careers right and so now that they're older and maybe their um vision has decreased they're scared to death of their independence being taken away. So number three is the best answer where you're teaching them that they need to be taking short drives, plan to take short drives, but at the same time also during do, do it during daylight hour, hours where visibility is best, okay? Next question. Which of the following assessment findings is most critical in the client who's currently being restrained with mechanical wrist restraints? One, angry, loud crying. Two, urinary incontinence. Three, reddened areas on the wrist. Or four, hands are cool to touch. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. 
And guys, what's most critical is number four, hands are cool to touch. Remember a couple questions ago, I was telling you when the patient's in restraints, you know, one of the important things you have to make sure is circulation, right? And you wanna make sure it's not too tight. Well, this answer, hands are cool to touch, that lets you know that those restraints are too tight and that patient's not getting adequate circulation. Why? Because the extremities, patient's skin's supposed to be what? Warm. You wanna know what makes that patient warm? Blood. So if the patient's not getting blood flow, instead of being warm, it's gonna be cool, which is bad. What's another sign of good circulation? Color, pinkness or redness, right? That pink, that pink color that the patient has, that lets you know that there's circulation. If there's not circulation, it's not gonna be, the skin's not gonna be nice and pink. Skin's gonna be what? Blanched, white or blue, cyanotic, okay? So our biggest uh, concern in this situation restraints is cool to touch because that means decreased circulation. And guys, if you can recall, circulation is a priority. Okay, in my uh, priority patients video, I give you guys a list of which patients took priority, who you're gonna run to first, and circulation falls under physiologic integrity, which means that is a priority patient. So out of all of the lists that we saw with the patient, you know, crying or being incontinence, what we care about the most is being cool to touch because we know that if their skin, if their hands cool to touch, that means they're not getting circulation and that's our biggest problem. Next question. The nurse is discussing a newly ordered diuretic with an older client who is homebound. Which of the following suggestion has the greatest potential for minimizing the client's risk for injury related to urinary urgency or incontinence? One, consider decreasing fluid intake after 6 p.m. Two, illuminate the path to the bathroom at night. Three, encourage the client to urinate immediately before bed. Four, encourage the client to take medication early in the morning. And I'll give you a moment to look at your, uh, think of your answer. Okay, guys. And by the way, all of these choices are excellent choices. You want to teach the patient all of these choices. But which one would be most significant and the correct answer is for encouraging the client to take the medication early in the morning? Why? You don't want a client that's taking diuretics to be waking up in the middle of the night to use the medication. Why? They're waking up from their sleep, they're groggy, they're sleepy, their vision isn't up to par. And so them trying to rush to get to the restroom to urinate, it's easy for them to have a fall. So that's why number four is the correct answer. By the way, guys, when patients are taking diuretics, that's why they need to take it early in the morning. So they'll have all day to use the restroom if they need to. By the time they go to bed at night, they won't be having that urgency or frequency. Next question. A nurse caring for an elderly client who has had surgery and is in the hospital knows that the client is at high risk for developing a nosocomial infection. One of the most important things that the nurse can do to prevent this client from obtaining a nosocomial infection is to one, practice appropriate hand hygiene, two, request prophylactic antibiotics for the client, three, place the client in isolation, or four, encourage the client to turn, turn cough, deep breathe every two hours. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer, guys, is number one, you wanna practice hand hygiene. The number one way to prevent infections in the facility is to wash your hands, hand hygiene. You're not gonna ask for an order for um, prophylactic antibiotics. Are you the doctor? So why are you asking for antibiotics? Okay, you can't play doctor, right? So you're not gonna do that. Let's see what our other choices were. You're not gonna place the client in isolation. To place the client in isolation, you have to have an order for the client to be in isolation, right? And four, encourage the client to turn, cough, deep breathe. That is wonderful for preventing post-op infections, right? After a patient has an effect, um, infection, after a patient had surgery, and you don't want them to get infection, you don't want them to get a DVT or pulmonary embolism, you are gonna encourage them to turn, cough, deep breathe. That's wonderful. But for preventing nosocomial infection, the number one thing that you can do is hand hygiene. Okay guys, um, 
Second to last question. A confused client needs to have restraints to prevent him from pulling out his Foley catheter. Which of the following can the nurse delegate to the nursing assistant personnel? One, apply restraints. Two, obtain the physician's order to restrain the client. Three, document the events that led to restraining the client. Or four, evaluating the effectiveness of the restraints. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. Correct answer is one, applying restraints. That is the only thing that the assistive personnel can do in these choices, okay? They can apply the restraints that you tell them to apply, but the, um, the assistive personnel has to be trained in applying restraints, but they are allowed to do that. Two, three, and four, only the RN can do. Obtaining the order, it's the RN that's gonna be calling the doctor and the RN has to tell the doctor what's going on with the patient that they're requesting the order. Three, documenting the events. The RN is the one who's going to be doing documenting the events, excuse me. And then number four, evaluating the effectiveness. That requires critical thinking. Only the RN can do that. Again, guys, if you guys have trouble with um, delegation, because this is a delegation question, what can the R, uh, RN do versus the LPN versus the CNA? If you guys are kind of iffy on delegation, please be sure to watch my delegation video. I go very in depth on what the RN absolutely must do they can't delegate it to anyone else versus what the lpn is allowed to do versus what the cna or assistive personnel is allowed to do and in this um question absolutely number one is the answer the assistive personnel is allowed to apply restraints please don't forget just like i told you in my previous video on delegations what else can the cna or assistive uh, personnel do they're allowed to do vital signs they're allowed to check the patient's glucose they're allowed to record and report what does that mean they're allowed to take the vital signs or ino and report it to the nurse they're allowed to gather equipment they're allowed to do adls and the list goes on if you have any questions about that watch my delegations video and last question a nurse finds an electrical cord has shorted out in a client's room causing a fire the nurse should do which of the following actions first one, activate the alarm. Two, confine the fire by closing the client's door. Three, remove the client from the room. Or four, extinguish the fire. And um, as I said in my last, um, not my last video, but a couple questions ago, I told you guys when it comes to a fire, you want to do race, R-A-C-E, okay? R stands for rescue. The first thing you're gonna do is rescue the client. You're gonna get the client out of there. You're gonna get them out of harm's way. The second thing you wanna do after you rescue the client, then you're gonna pull the alarm, okay? You're gonna activate the alarm. C is confined. You wanna confine that fire, so you're gonna close the doors and windows, make sure there's as least as least oxygen as possible because remember oxygen that's what fuels the fire it helps it grow and the last thing you're going to do is extinguish the fire so guys i hope that you found this video to be helpful if you guys have anything that you guys want me to talk about that you'd like me to do questions on any demonstrations please make sure that you leave a comment and i will make sure that i make a video for you last and not least last and not least please be sure to press that like and subscribe button below. Guys, that is what fuels me to keep the content coming and to keep the videos coming. So thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time.